the man of the crowd. It was well said of a certain German book that, as lest sich nicht lesen, it does not permit itself to be read. There are some secrets which do not permit themselves to be told. Now and then, alas, the conscience of man takes up a burden so heavy in horror that it can be thrown down only into the grave. And thus the essence of all crime is undivulged. Not long ago, about the closing in of an evening in autumn, I sat at the large bow window of the Dachins Hotel in London. For some months I had been ill, but was now convalescent and, with returning strength, found myself in one of those happy moods which are so precisely the converse of ennui, moods of the keenest appetency, when the intellect surpasses greatly its everyday condition. With a cigar in my mouth and a newspaper in my lap, I had been amusing myself for the greater part of the afternoon, now in poring over advertisements, now in observing the promiscuous company in the room, and now in peering through the smoky panes into the street. This latter is one of the principal thoroughfares of the city, and had been very much crowded during the whole day. But as the darkness came on, the throng momently increased, and by the time the lamps were well lighted, two dense and continuous tides of population were rushing past the door. At first my observations took an abstract and generalizing turn. Soon, however, I descended to details and regarded with minute interest the innumerable varieties of figure, dress, and gait. By far the greater number of those who went by had a satisfied, business-like demeanor, and seemed to be thinking only of making their way through the press. Their brows were knit, and their eyes rolled quickly. When pushed against by fellow wayfarers, they evinced no symptom of impatience. Others, still a numerous class, were restless in their movements, had flushed faces, and talked and gesticulated to themselves, as if feeling in solitude on account of the very denseness of the company around. When impeded, these people ceased muttering, but redoubled their gesticulations, and awaited, with an overdone smile upon the lips, the course of the persons impeding them. There was nothing very distinctive about these two large classes beyond what I have noted. Their attire belonged to that order which is pointedly termed the decent. They were undoubtedly noblemen, merchants, attorneys, tradesmen, stock jobbers, men of leisure and men actively engaged in affairs of their own, conducting business upon their own responsibility. They did not greatly excite my attention. The tribe of clerks was an obvious one, and here I discerned two remarkable divisions. There were the junior clerks of flash houses, young gentlemen with tight coats, bright boots, well-oiled hair, and supercilious lips. The division of the upper clerks, or of the steady old fellows, was not possible to mistake. These were known by their coats and pantaloons of black or brown, with white cravats and waistcoats, broad, solid-looking shoes, and thick hose or gaiters. They had all slightly bald heads, from which the right ears, long used to pen-holding, had an odd habit of standing off on end. I observed that they always removed or settled their hats with both hands, as the night deepened, so deepened to me the interest of the scene. For not only did the general character of the crowd materially alter, but the gas lamps, feeble at first in their struggle with the dying day, had now gained ascendancy and threw over everything a garish luster. The wild effects of the light enchained me to an examination of individual faces and although the rapidity with which the world of light flitted before the window prevented me from casting more than a glance upon each visage, still it seemed that I could frequently read, even in the brief interval of a glance, the history of long years. I was thus occupied in scrutinizing the mob when suddenly there came into view a countenance that of a decrepit old man some sixty-five or seventy years of age, 
which had once arrested and absorbed my whole attention on account of the absolute idiosyncrasy of his expression. As I endeavored to form some analysis of the meaning conveyed, there arose confusedly and paradoxically within my mind the ideas of vast mental power, of caution, of avarice, of malice, of bloodthirstiness, of merriment, of excessive terror, of supreme despair. I felt singularly aroused, startled, fascinated. How wild a history, I said to myself, is written within that bosom. Then came a craving desire to keep the man in view, to know more of him. Hurriedly putting on an overcoat and seizing my hat and cane, I made my way into the street and pushed through the crowd in the direction which I had seen him take, for he had already disappeared. With some little difficulty I at length came within sight of him, approached and followed him closely, yet cautiously, so as not to attract his attention. I had now a good opportunity of examining his person. He was short in stature, very thin, and apparently very feeble. His clothes, generally, were filthy and ragged, but as he came now and then within the strong glare of a lamp, I perceived that his linen, although dirty, was of beautiful texture, and my vision deceived me, or I caught a glimpse both of a diamond and of a dagger. It was now fully nightfall, and a thick, humid fog hung over the city, soon ending in a settled and heavy rain. For my own part I did not much regard the rain, the lurking of an old fever in my system rendering the moisture somewhat pleasant. Tying a handkerchief about my mouth, I kept on. By and by he passed into a cross street, which, although densely filled with people, was not quite so much thronged as the main one he had quitted. Here a change in his demeanor became evident. He walked more slowly and with less object than before, crossed and recrossed the way without apparent aim. A second turn brought us into a square, brilliantly lighted and overflowing with life. The old manner of the stranger reappeared. His chin fell upon his breast, while his eyes rolled wildly in every direction. I was surprised, however, to find upon his having made the circuit of the square that he turned and retraced his steps. Still more was I astonished to see him repeat the same walk several times. A few minutes brought us to a large and busy bazaar, with the localities of which the stranger appeared well acquainted, and where his original demeanor again became apparent, as he forced his way among the host of buyers and sellers. He entered shop after shop, priced nothing, spoke no word, and looked at all objects with a wild and vacant stare. I was now utterly amazed at his behavior, and firmly resolved that we should not part until I had satisfied myself in some measure respecting him. A loud-toned clock struck eleven, and the company were fast deserting the bazaar. A shopkeeper, in putting up a shutter, jostled the old man, and at the instant I saw a strong shudder come over his frame. He hurried into the street looked anxiously around him for an instant, and then ran with incredible swiftness through many crooked and people-less lanes, until we emerged once more upon the great thoroughfare whence we had started, the street of the Dachin's Hotel. It no longer wore, however, the same aspect. It was still brilliant with gas, but the rain fell fiercely, and there were few persons to be seen. The stranger grew pale, he walked moodily some paces up the once populous avenue, then, with a heavy sigh, turned in the direction of the river, and plunging through a great variety of devious ways, came out at length in view of one of the principal theaters. It was about being closed, and the audience were thronging from the doors. I observed that he now took the course in which had gone the greater number of the audience. As he proceeded, the company grew more scattered, and his old uneasiness and vacillation were resumed. For some time he followed closely a party of some ten or twelve roisterers, but from this number one by one dropped off, 
until three only remained together in a narrow and gloomy lane little frequented. The stranger paused and for a moment seemed lost in thought. Then, with every mark of agitation, pursued rapidly a route which brought us to the verge of the city, amid regions very different from those we had hitherto traversed. It was the most noisome quarter of London, where everything wore the worst impress of the most deplorable poverty and of the most desperate crime. Yet, as we proceeded, the sounds of human life revived by sure degrees, and at length large bands of the most abandoned of a London populace were seen reeling to and fro. The spirits of the old man again flickered up as a lamp which is near its death hour. Once more he strode onward with elastic tread. Suddenly a corner was turned, a blaze of light burst upon our sight, and we stood before one of the huge suburban temples of intemperance, one of the palaces of the fiend, Jin. It was now nearly daybreak, but a number of wretched inebriates still pressed in and out of the flaunting entrance. With a half-shriek of joy, the old man forced a passage within, resumed at once his original bearing, and stalked backward and forward without apparent object among the throng. He had not been thus long occupied, however, before a rush to the doors gave token that the host was closing them for the night. It was something even more intense than despair that I then observed upon the countenance of the singular being whom I had watched so pertinaciously. Long and swiftly he fled, while I followed him resolute not to abandon a scrutiny in which I now felt an interest all-absorbing. The sun arose while we proceeded, and, when we had once again reached that most thronged mart of the populous town, the street of the Dachin's Hotel, it presented an appearance of human bustle and activity scarcely inferior to what I had seen on the evening before. And here, amid the increasing confusion, did I persist in my pursuit of the stranger. But, as usual, he walked to and fro, and during the day did not pass from out the turmoil of that street. And, as the shades of the second evening came on, I grew wearied unto death, and stopping fully in front of the wanderer, gazed at him steadfastly in the face. He noticed me not, but resumed his solemn walk, while I, ceasing to follow, remained absorbed in contemplation. This old man, I said at length, is the type and the genius of deep crime. He refuses to be alone. He is the man of the crowd. It will be in vain to follow, for I shall learn no more of him, nor of his deeds. The Man of the Crowd was written by Edgar Allan Poe and read by Owen Teal. It was abridged by Pete Nichols and the producer was Karen Rose. It was a Sweet Talk production for BBC Radio 4 Extra. And there's one more tale to go after the weekend at this time. This is BBC Radio 4 Extra. Extra.